What's up, traders? Welcome to the Day Trading Show. Today, I've got a solo episode. It's just me and a special guest. We're sitting down with Ron Friedman. A lot of you guys know him as Ronchero on Twitter. He runs a room called Trading the Post with Sang Lucci and all the guys over there in the trade space circle and all that. Ron is a veteran trader. He shares a ton of experience, probably one of the most experienced traders that we've had on the show so far. So you're going to learn a ton. He's calling in from his home, one of his second homes in Hawaii. We talk about his biggest loss, multiple million dollar loss in three days during 9-11. We talk about how to overcome that loss and what it means to bounce back, what it means to adapt. We cover so much in this episode. You guys are going to love it. I want to let everybody know the link in the description will take you to ASFX TV. If you want to join our trading room and see me, Tom, James, and our team of professional traders live, I've got a three-day free trial link in the description for you guys. I've also got all of Ron's links in the description. If you want to connect with Ron and check out his room, please do that as well. So enough out of me. Enjoy the episode. Enjoy the conversation with Ron Chero. All right, everybody, we are back. We've got a very special guest. So I'm here solo today. It's just me and Ron. Ron is actually coming in, not from his home in California, but from a special destination in Hawaii. You said you're in Kona, right? Right outside of Kona? I'm in Kona. That's right. Yep. That's awesome. Well, I appreciate you joining me, Ron. This is going to be really good. I'm looking forward to this conversation. Me too. So Ron and I, for everybody listening, are connected through Lucci and all the guys. They're running the Misfit Happy Hour. If you're not connected with them, make sure you're checking out Lucci's page and all the stuff that they're doing. Um What's Charlie Bathgate up to, Ron? First question. I haven't seen him on any of the Misfit Happy Hours. Where's he at? You know, that's a good question. I, um, I'll i give him a hard time. Charlie is still around and is good. very much involved in the operations day-to-day -day, uh, with, with what happens. And um, th that's a good point. I haven't seen him on a uh, webinar recently. Also. I like his personality. He's very like yeah. casual and blunt and like relatable. He's not like staging anything. So I really enjoyed his questioning when he would have you guys on and you guys would do some good stuff. And also got to give a shout out to Chris Katie. Chris does a lot of good stuff with you guys. You guys have like a, a super team over there. Like you guys are. Oh, you. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. It is, it is a good, it is a good team. It's taken a long time for, uh, for, for Lucci to um, assemble people that, that he's comfortable with and, and that he feels is aligned. And, you know, I kind of feel the same way with, um, with Charlie and Lucci and, and Wall Street Jesus and, and Katie, like everybody uh, does their own thing, but still has the same um, alignment of, of what it is that we all ultimately wind up looking at. Right? Which is huge for like the cohesiveness of the team. If you weren't aligned, yeah. it would not be popular. It wouldn't grow to like the level that it's growing. How did you link up with Lucci? Because I think I was following Lucci before you and him linked up. I want to say you all linked up like three years ago, four years ago. I think it's been more like, seven okay six or seven years now okay and i linked up with uh with lucci i was um I, I was in a spot where i i had some health issues that i was dealing with so i had some downtime and i was looking to re-engage with what i was doing trading wise <clears throat> and i was just looking around on the web because one of the things that i like to do is um i but and, and this dates back to when i started thinking about well what I do, can I, is it, is it something that I can do to help teach others? Not from a standpoint of I'm bored. I want to help other people. It's like, what can I do to help pay it forward? And, you know, who are other people that I can learn from and, you know, really find something that works. It's very, in my opinion, it's very rare to find somebody in, in our business that does what we do that can either teach you something that actually works and or give you methodology that is based on and in sound reasonable you know um foundational practices whether that be uh the um the ability to uh actually you know do something like read technical analysis um be able to understand option flow be able, be able to understand how to communicate that information to people who are looking for it and I only have ever had a couple of instances where I've come across individuals who've been able to teach me something that I can understand that works and can translate to other individuals that weren't Ivy League educated, that weren't trained in the the the, the big institutions like a Goldman or a JP Morgan or you know let's say a, a hedge fund environment and some other type of boutique environment where 
you know, they're, they're learning a, um, a skill that's, that's closely, uh, you know, proprietary or, or guarded. And I came across Lucci and actually came across Wall Street Jesus and just started listening to the stream. I was like, okay, it's interesting that he's using and watching option flow to see if he can find some advantage. So I watched it for um, a couple of months and wasn't really very active or participative. And then I kept seeing this, this thing for, um, hey, check out Sang Lucci. And I was like, I don't understand who this Sang Lucci guy is and what what is he what talking about? What is a Sang Lucci? And exactly. I was like, what <laughs> what is this? I would, and for you know, again, because there's so many uh, bad actors in in our space, I was thinking, okay, I'm I'm being sucked in to be sold education, right? I started listening to Lucci and Lucci kind of, he, he changes around how he communicates. Sometimes he'll, he'll get on like right now, he currently does a live Twitch stream daily and he trades in the morning and he kind of tells people what he does and what he's looking for. And when I was doing it, he had like this series of YouTube videos that he was putting out about, um, you know, how he reads tape. And I was like, well, what does he mean by how he's reading tape and using it in conjunction with flow? I wound up taking his course and it, it wasn't terribly expensive. And I thought, well, the worst case scenario is, is that I donate three grand and right. find out that he's full of shit right. or I, you know, I learned something. And when he taught it and he taught how to read level two and how it worked with other things, for example, technical analysis and or flow, it was kind of a light bulb moment. And I was like, oh, this really is going to make a difference with what I already know and have been taught, and this is going to help amplify it, and and that's that actually happened. So then I I started communicating with Lucci, and I was like, listen, here's who I am, here's my background. I was trained um, by a market maker. This is what I know. This is how I think. What you've taught enhances what we do, and I want to be somebody in your universe that can help you educate others to become successful traders. So that was, it was simply me just going to him and, and saying, here's who I am. This is how I think I can help you. Are you interested? And, and he gave me an opportunity to run a beta program and we ran a beta program and there were six or seven traders in there and we had a great year <clears throat> and he believed in what, you know, I was talking mm -hmm. about and we just applied it and it took off from there. That's awesome. That's awesome. Yeah. Lucci has been uh, a cornerstone for a lot of traders. Like I've, I've spoken to a lot of people who have gone through the course and been through the options room and seen how it works and everyone speaks so highly of it. You mentioned, and I, I think we should back up a little bit for people that don't know you as much, Ron. You mentioned you were trained by a market maker. I kind of know your background, but maybe give everybody the 3000 foot overview. <laughs> how you sure. were trained, where were you trained? I think it was Chicago, correct? Um, so my background, uh, I started in gosh it was like 1992 or three okay i was a retail broker i started as a retail broker uh and i worked for a company called oldie discount which was eventually bought by um i think h and r block okay and back in the day it was hey you're you're going to be trained as a broker and the idea was that we made a market in a lot of different stocks <clears throat> that had huge, massive bid ask spreads. Like back in the day, the NASDAQ would allow you to have a bid ask spread of $2, $3. So if your desk makes a market in that particular security, if you get your client to buy at the market, the spread, let's say it's three bucks and the client buys a thousand shares of stock. Well, the desk makes three grand on the trade, right? Cause that's the bid ask spread. Right. So as a broker, you know, you get a piece of that. So it was not a good model for uh, the clients. It was a good model for the trading desk, especially it was an okay model for the brokers. And then it was just a cracker Jack, you know, um, environment where it was, Hey, you need to be on the phone from, six o'clock in the morning till nine o'clock at night you need to be making 300 dial, dials a day wow. and we're keeping your stats and if you don't do it you're going to get fired kind of thing right wow. it was it was a brutal environment um and it was just like you either make it or you don't what right? were those phone calls like like what were you what would you because you're basically selling people the stock or the or the asset right it's it's the it's one of the worst um 
selling environments that you could possibly imagine. You're calling complete strangers at dinner time and asking them to invest their money based on a recommendation that you make as a 20 something. They don't know you. They have no idea whether you know what you're talking about or not. And really the only thing you're telling them is, Hey, I want you to buy the stock. Why? Because it's going up. I mean, that's how they wanted you to, to sell. Right. But that's, that's crazy. I, I think it, it's, it's a great environment to learn how to sell, right? Because it's the, like you said, one of the worst, but I'll tell you, I started in finance with Northwestern Mutual in their internship program. We weren't doing 300 yeah. dials. We had to do 50 dials a day. Same yeah. thing, cold calling people at 19 to sell them life insurance, even worse. Yes. Not only you had upside when you're selling them stock. I was just sure. talking to them about their debt and I'm a stranger and I'm a young guy and like, no. Nope. Yeah. So I think that is actually worse than what you had. You know what I'm saying? But both are really, really tough, but I'm sure looking back on it, you probably are grateful for it because it taught you a ton, right? It taught me a lot of things. So it one of the, one of the great things that it taught me was, well, gosh, the, the, the profit skew is so far in favor of the trader as opposed to the broker. Why am I a broker? You know, this, the, I'm the one doing the work and I'm the one bringing in the client and putting, telling them to put their capital at risk based on information that I don't know if it is accurate or not. Right. I'm new. I really don't. It, broker training teaches you how to sell and generate clients and commissions. It doesn't teach you anything about the market. It, right. You learn nothing about right. the market. You learn the basics of how to get through a series seven exam, right? Which is a lot of market stuff, a lot of legal stuff, more legal stuff than more anything stuff. else, yep. right? Yep. More, this is how you know if you've screwed up and put your client in an inappropriate investment. That's really what it focuses on, which is fine, right? Because everybody's got a CYA, right? Um, that definitely taught me that I was in the wrong spot in the investment world. And I was like, I need to figure out how to be a trader and not a broker. So what'd you do? How'd you pivot? Wanted well, so in, um, I ultimately had to leave that brokerage world because there weren't any opportunities. When Once you're a broker, the opportunity to move into an environment where there's, where the trading desk will have you, it typically doesn't exist. It's there, there's typically a, um, a background, a mold, who do you know on the desk that's going to vouch for you and get you in there? Um, and then basically, if you get that opportunity, depending upon where you're at, you really better be like on the ball and impress some people in the right way early, because if you don't, they ignore you and you, you're out the door very quickly, right? It's not a very, it, it's not a nurturing environment whatsoever. Um, but there was a guy who worked on the floor of the Philadelphia exchange on, on their, on the, on the options exchange. Um, he has since passed away. His name is Ron Ionary, and Ron was somebody who was the biggest bookmaker on Apple 3Com Dell computer back in the day before the dot-com bust up. Um, I don't remember exactly how I met Ron. It was, I think it was at one of those conferences where um, it's a bunch of people like us that show up and are like, hey, here's who I am. This is my program, blah, 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 blah. I remember walking past um, a booth and he was having a conversation somewhere with, with some bond guy. And it, I, I don't know why, but the conversation struck me out of the corner of my eye. And I was just like, you know, who are you? What are you doing here? Um, and you know, what do you do? So I contacted him, you know, randomly after this event and he was, you know, he was like, if you, if you want to learn, you know, I, I'll, I'll teach you what I know. So, um, he taught me what he knew. He evolved into a service like what we do today. He called it ion options. And then ultimately he wound up, um, doing some stuff with the Nigerian brothers. But prior to that, I was somebody that he trained um, and trained from a market maker point of view. So I learned a ton of information from him, and that's kind of where I made the transition. Um, I had left brokerage, and I had gone into, uh, into sales, and I was selling um, medical devices for a very long time and, and had a really nice 
uh, career there. And along the way, I was trained by him. And, you know, just like everybody else, you save up, you build a deck and you work your way into a spot where you can start to, um, to trade on your own. And I think a lot of people are, are probably, you know, looking for that type of, of, of break or, or opportunity. I, I was given that, you know, that opportunity, I had to work my way to, to get there. And, you know, that's, that's kind of where uh, I found, you know, find myself today. So I, I just kept kind of evolving. It was something that um, it never, you know, how some people latch on to something um, passion wise, and then you, you know, there's something that you latch on to that's not necessarily passion, but it's just something that you need to be doing right. Like different than like a different level than passion. It's just like, oh, this is what I'm supposed to be doing. Yeah. And, and that's, that's what, that's what this is. Like I, I wake up on the weekends. I'm like, forget it. Like I, I sleep, right. Like, because I'm up early on the West coast, right. But on, you know, on, on market days, like I don't need an alarm clock. I'm up. Right. I'm like, I totally awesome. can relate to another, that. Yeah, another day to go in and try and solve a puzzle, right? Solve the puzzle. It's like a compulsion, but in a good way where it's like, it's yeah. pulling at you and it, it's, it draws you in. It's like deeper than passion. I totally understand yeah. that. Absolutely. Yeah. You, yeah. your perspective is like, and this is why I was so excited to talk to you because you come from a background of a, like with a wide breadth of knowledge, I feel like, especially like because you've seen the transformation of trading through technology and what technology has done, which a lot of people like the guys that I communicate with more, they haven't been through that type of a transition. They haven't seen mm -hmm. that. But one thing before we even talk about the technology, like that I want everyone that's listening to take from what you just said is because is that you had a background where you were trained by a market maker and still how many years later are you paying Lucci? Yeah, it was only three grand, but still three grand. And you're still paying to learn things. I think that speaks a lot about your open-mindedness that probably has led you to a lot of your success in life. Would you agree? Yeah, I would agree with that. And in in what we do, because things have evolved and changed so much from, from where I started to where we're at today, and they just continue to change and evolve. You know, I think so many people will come in and, and they'll say things like, and I live in an area and I'm surrounded by a lot of really smart, successful people. And, you know, they're interested in things like, well, you know, what do you do that gives you edge? And why should I believe in what you tell me when, you know, my my guy over here, um, who's a PhD from Stanford has just written you know, this particular algorithm. And I'm like, well, I'm not the guy who's going to do that. That's not what I do. Like I, I can, I can never compete in that world or that space. I don't have that kind of a, a brain, but what I do have is the experience and the knowledge to, to be able to look at these different ways of, of doing it. And I don't have to be the guy with the big brain that writes this big algorithm. And guess what? By the time they write it and it gets up and running, it has a finite lifespan because the next guy with the next big brain is going to come along. That's not a sustainable model for me. I, I went about trying to find something sustainable. I took a lot of road rash along the way. And like I said, there's only been a total of, of three people individually who have been able to teach me something that I can that that I can use, I can work in that I can and make my own and teach to other people and and help them find success. It's not it, not everybody can find success, right? But those who can apply what they're taught can find success often with what we do. So it was Ron, it was Lucci. Who was the third person? Do you know who Brian Shannon is? Of course, Fiwa. So exactly. So those are those are the three teachers, and and I, I don't know Brian from you know anything other than um, his books and his YouTube videos, and from applying what he's taught. And when I layer these things on, it's like, whoa! And everything else in between, I'm happy to, and I have over the course of time. I've taken a lot of different courses. I've thrown money at different courses. Most of the time, it, like I said, for, with the exception of these three guys, most of the time, it's just like that was it, it was it was money that was well spent only from the standpoint of realizing that's not the guy that's going to teach me and probably not anybody else to do anything other than this guy's out here 
marketing and and taking others and taking other people's money. But it's just the unfortunate downside of of our business. So it's funny you use that word marketing because when I first met Lucci, he he I, I don't remember how it came up in the sentence, but he called me a marketer, and in my head, <laughs> I was like, bro. I ain't even going to say nothing. I'm just going to be around long enough for you to realize that I'm more than that. And now here we are, me and him are working with a guy in the DR. We are trying to get another trade space opened up. So now he takes me a lot more seriously. He yep. he, he literally on the call the other day was talking about how he educates and I educate. He wants to create other Austin Silvers. So if he thought I was still a marketer, he would have, uh, I think he would have not been saying that. So it is interesting because yep. now with the internet, and this can kind of talk about with technology, how it's changed everything. Like anybody can start a business it takes a certain kind of person to treat it like a business it's a different thing but with marketing and with the right type of pictures you can play these algorithms and get a lot of attention and then what ends up happening is the attention those people that have that they they do a good job you have to give good marketing credit right you get the attention but what ends up from my perspective is the repeating information they heard that was previously not proven to them. It was, it's incorrect. For example, technical indicators don't work. That adage was so repeated, so repeated. So, but it's because people didn't know how to use them correctly. And they heard right. someone say that, and then they bought into that belief and then they repeated it to their bigger audience. And then it, it perpetuates out. So I think like that to me is the big drawback of what technology has done to the marketing side of our business. Do you feel yep. like it's probably the same? Have you seen any other pros or cons of how technology has kind of impacted what we do? Well, I mean, we, we, we all have to, I mean, you have to market at some level, right? Um, I think that the, what you see, I think what is difficult for people, whether it's casual or not to look at is to make a determination, whether it's a bad actor or somebody that they can believe. Right. Yeah. And I think that technology is at a level where it's difficult for the individual to make that determination. So I think that technology can be a really wonderful thing, especially in marketing, but it also has its its negative downside as well, right? And one of the things that we try to do, that I try to do, I think that Lucci tries to do, that you try to do, is to um, you know is is to forego things like um, hype and look at my lifestyle as opposed to we're trying to teach you how to fish and have a sustainable way of generating income slash wealth that will be meaningful to the individual and you know their their family and or loved ones and I, I think that there there's a big difference there in how it's presented and I think that it's very easy to dangle the the shiny keychain and attract a lot of people but what is the depth of that do you know what kind of car I drive Ron I do not exactly that's the point Right? Exactly. That's yep. the point. I don't know what kind you, of car I drive. No, I have no idea. That's what I'm saying. If, but if you go to like when you when we had our conversation on the Misfit Show a couple of weeks <clears> ago, <throat> you were like, "Austin, I'm seeing you everywhere." But you're seeing me through my content of like my education, where I feel like I can provide value, not through the lifestyle. I think it was yep. Gary V. Are you familiar with Gary Vaynerchuk? I don't think so. So he's a very well known entrepreneur. He's based in New York City, um, immigrant ground up and now very, very successful, like comes from the ground, very poor. They were split in toilet paper kind of thing. And he had a lot of content in 2014 to 2018 about building a personal brand. And that was like who I bought into. And he always said, you can choose the path. You can go the flashy way, basically, like we're talking about and get the short lived attention. It's really hard to maintain that. Or you can go the long, slow way, be honest, be transparent, provide value through provide like real value, I guess is what I'm supposed to say. Not that like surface level value, if that's what you would call yeah. it. Right. Yeah. And I, I really bought into that. And I also think it, 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 and this is maybe getting too deep into this psychologically, but like, I think it comes from how you're raised. Like my dad raised me like to be entrepreneurial. He pushed me to be entrepreneurial when I wanted to do a garage sale, but he pushed me to do it the right way. I'll tell you a quick story. One time I was doing a lemonade stand with friends. We're like 12 years old. Like we're young we're sitting on the corner and my idea was, say we're donating all the money to the Red Cross, but I wasn't going to donate the money to the Red Cross. I was just going to keep the money myself, right? My dad ripped me up, bro. Like yep. ripped me. Up. That lesson stuck with me still to this day. We're talking 20 something years ago. So I think it's like those things really do come back to 
play. Like if you are raised with morals and like do right by the customer, you'll get more customers. That simple thing, you know, I think that's a part of it. And like, in a way, social media has kind of made people forget that, you know, they made people with the attention spans like this, you'll forget that I posted that flashy thing. So why, why would I not do it? That kind of, but I think like you said, it kind of builds up and then that's what ends up being your reputation. You know what I mean? And yep. I just decided I'd rather be known as the guy that posts a lot, shares a lot, overshares, but you never, but it's never lifestyle stuff. And I feel like I get a lot of, and I'm sure you do as well. I get a lot of people that tell me, I appreciate you not showing that stuff. I've been watching your videos for two years. Now I'm buying your course or now I'm doing the program because I, now I really see like, this is the real deal versus these other guys that they follow. You know what I mean? So it kind of makes it easy for guys like us. They come around, the good customers come around eventually because they taste the quick stuff because every human is the same. We all want that instant gratification, but then some guys stay, they have that compulsion, that passion for trading and they stay looking for the right education. They don't just buy one thing it sucks and then they bail you know which some people yep. do of course of course yeah well this um, is this is kind of a douchey flex then right like, no I mean, yeah yeah no <laughs> but not really because you know i i think it's the best kind of flex honestly like if you as a trader and tell me what you think because you've been doing this longer than me i feel like if you're gonna flex anything it's time freedom like that is the thing to flex i don't care really about the car you have anybody can rent like you or me could go rent a lamborghini and we could lease a lamborghini like okay cool does that really sat like, is that really what you want in your soul? No. But like when you can have a home in Hawaii and go there every month and take your wife or your family and enjoy that, create memories. That's what life is about. You know what I mean? I mean, you, you said you had some health issues in the past. I've had some issues in my family where you do get to see, I think life is gone. Life is not only, not and even, it could be right? gone. Just change and be completely different in an instant. It in can an happen instant, that fast. Exactly. In an, on the most beautiful sunny day where you're sitting where I'm sitting right now, you know, the mo and everything can change. So you have to really take what trading gives you. I think not take it for granted. You've got to take it seriously. So if there is a flex, it's like, yeah, I worked my ass off. You worked your ass off to take that vacation, to have that lifestyle. The car, like any real trader knows like the car you drive doesn't matter. Anybody with a line of credit can rent at least a car. Like it's just, so superficial, you know, so it's got to be deeper. And I think that probably ties into what you said earlier about having the thing that like, you you can't not do it. You know what I mean? Like, it, yeah. it's like that, that attachment to it that's deeper than just compassion. I want to yes. go back really quick though, Ron, because we did yeah. go in, in, around a couple of things. Sure. You've probably had some big wins and some big losses. So I'm going to put the ball in your court. I want you to share with the audience either a really big win and how it made you feel, what you learned from it, or a really big loss. How much did you lose? What did you do? How did you recover from it? I'm going to let you pick either I, side of that. I, I think my, my opinion, my experience has been that the losses is what clarifies or provides the most salient teaching moments. Anybody in a bull market that finds a little bit of a seam or a little bit of an edge and understands where to buy or how to buy, let's say dips is, you know, a hero and everybody's a phenomenal trader in an up market, right? Well, what happens in a bear market or what happens when you blow up and I've blown up, right? And I, I blew up in spectacular fashion um, after uh, the 9-11 really? tragedy. Really? Yeah. 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 Um, I, what happened? I, so I was long the market heavy and I lost 1.6 million in three days. And that was, that was the worst loss, uh, that I had ever experienced. And that was a turning point for me to figure out how do I do this in a way where I'm not a directional only trader, which is the only thing that I knew. And a lot of it came from um, what I just told you earlier, you know, buy the stock. Why? Because it's going up, right? Stocks don't go up in perpetuity. That's not how they work. So the question was, well, how do you, how do you protect yourself? What's, what's the way to do it? And, and that's one of the reasons why I found Ron Ionary was I knew what options were I knew how to use them, but only in a very, very limited way. And if you if you know options and you understand options, they can be used in so many. It's a Swiss Army knife. But if you don't know how to use the Swiss Army knife and you pull out 
the spoon when you need the screwdriver, you're hosed, right? So can so, I say like you were mainly one dimensional with the options? Maybe one just one, right? calls, mm. something like that, simple options yeah. trading. I ha I had a friend who was who who took I can't remember what it was, five, ten grand or something like that, put it on Micron in the early days. Micron had blew out earnings and he turned 10 grand into like 75 overnight. And I was like, oh, all right, I want to do that too. So I started doing that. And it it in an up market, it worked great. But when that tragic event occurred the bottom fell out right and it was all and, and it's gone and when you're an options trader you have time and you have volatility so there's time decay there's volatility and when those things disappear whatever it is that you have is gone so if you don't understand how to use that leverage you are you all you're doing is is putting your money out there on a silver plate for somebody else to take right interesting so issue. that was that was the moment where that was the teaching moment. That was the most salient moment for me was there has to be another way that I can continue to do this and yet protect myself from the unseen, from from the event that's going to happen that I have no clue is is coming, nor will I ever see coming. And and that persists in how I trade today. I I didn't know. That that's what I needed to do after that moment. It took me years to learn the skills, how to do it. So that one moment put me on a different trajectory for years to figure out how I fixed that one moment in time. Right. So the way that you know I did that is is what we do today over in in my room, which is trading the post. Right. It's it's a it's a more conservative way to trade something of of good quality that's had bad luck that's been hammered and trade it to the upside after it's been through its its beating and how do we protect it from the unforeseen event in in the future so that's that's what that that's that's what brought me to everything that i that i teach is foundational today what did you do so after that, those that, that was you... it that was the, that was the biggest the biggest lesson is is for sure a loss for me for sure and i totally agree and i know everybody listening agrees your wins they're great. But when you really, I, I think for me, it was like understanding that even if I have a great read, whether it's your option strategy or my spy strategy, whatever we're doing, you can have the best setup, back tested 50,000 trades. You know what the best one is. It can still be a loser. You can still face that uncertainty event. So I started to learn that I think like three years ago, and it made it very clear the outcomes of the trades are not in my control. Mm hmm. So then when I'm knowing that the outcomes are not in my control, you kind of play, like you said, from that more conservative process focused role. But even in that position, or maybe I guess more so in that position, you understand the wins because the outcomes are out of your control. They're kind of like irrelevant. You did the right thing yeah. to follow that. The loss is like, okay, what's going on? Like what's, what's, did I read something wrong? Or is it just the market doing what market does? Me taking a loss. Um, yep. So many places I want to go from that. But first- after those, after one or two days of the, as that loss started to happen, what, like you must've been feeling every emotion in the book. What did you take a time? Like, did you take time off? How did you bounce back from that? We can't just let that go. Um, so it, it took, like I said, it took years, right? Like I was, I was out, I was out for years looking for how do I fix it? How do I how do you get multidimensional? How do you get how that knowledge that'll prevent it from happening again? How do I rebuild this? How do I get back in there? That that's what I mean when I say it's not just passion. It's something that just kept, you know, keeps tugging at me. It's like, listen, I feel like I'm not that far off from from solving a good piece of this puzzle. It doesn't mean that you solve the the whole thing on a daily basis. That's not rational. That's not possible. But if you can solve the majority of it, and when you're wrong, get you know. A, a, a situation where you don't get punished for it, then you're in a great spot. That's very well said. Do you feel like that lesson is one of those moments where you could have walked away and you just, like, like you said, you were out, you could have never come back to it, but you did. Yes. So like, yep. that's probably one of those moments where the market has taken people and made it. So they never come back. W would you say that a 
prerequisite for successful trading, or I guess like a prerequisite for like consistently profitable trading, not every day, of course, but like making it your income has to be that level of passion beyond the word passion, call it compulsion or whatever that we're talking Is that what you've seen in the traders you worked with? They have to be at the desk. Even if you blow them out, they're going to come back and try to solve the puzzle. No, I think everybody comes from a different uh, background is look and, and is looking for something different. I mean, there are plenty of people who would like to just simply, hey, I, I love my real world job, but I'm I'm looking for something else to help me grow my financial cushion, right? Is you know, can you help me? And it's like, yeah. well, that just that that just changes to time frame, right? So yeah, there's a there's an adjustment you can make to time frame. Yeah. So, you know, are you a short term? Are you an intermediate term? Are you a long term trader? What is your what is your background? And you know, can you apply the different time frames to fit what it is that that you're looking for so somebody that comes in and is like hey i can't sit at the screen every single day is is there a way for me to do this you know the answer is yes it all comes back to can you apply correctly and there are people who want to sit down and be in front of the screen and trade multiple times a day I mean, they ask the question is there a way for me to do this the answer is yes. and it comes back to time frame and do you understand where you have probability and where you don't and you, if you get that wrong, do you know how to adjust? Right. Do you coach more traders in your room? Do you think that are part-time trying to become full-time? Or do you think it's more of those people that are working another job and just want to supplement income? What do you think the split is? I think it's a mix. And I think it's probably, um, I, I think there are probably a handful more that work nine to five jobs that are looking for a combination of, Hey, can you, can you help me with something long-term and a combination of, Hey, I'd like to migrate into doing something different. I don't run into a lot of people who tell me I'm looking for an answer to get away from a nine to five job. I think there are plenty of people out there like that. I don't think I attract those people because there's, there's not a good answer for somebody who wants to get out of what it is that they do nine to five because they hate it and they want to do this because they see it as a quick way or an easier way for them to make money. Right. Does that make sense? A hundred percent. What do you yeah. do? You, like, cause I've seen all the guys that I know that have either quit their job or tried to go like all in on trading right away. They always end up having to go back and get a job. They, I've never seen anybody just jump in and make that work. Do you think that like, it makes your your odds of success or odds of like ach achieving that level of knowledge that would make you successful are they greater if you don't stress yourself out and cut off your sources of income because then you cut off your income now you're trading from a place of rent is due and bills are due and i don't know anyone that trades well from that spot do you no it's hard it's really hard it's hard i think the majority of people have to um migrate into it because if like you said if you if you just turn it off and you're just going to try and figure it out. I don't know how you, I don't know how you do that. No, I totally agree. Do you feel like on the side <clears throat> now with all these prop firms, cause I know we wanted to talk about this too, with all these potential for like newer, younger traders, not just younger, just anyone new to trading, wow. they could use other people's money. Do you think that that accelerates the potential for them to transition or move into that place? Like how, you know what I mean? Are you working with guys that are using prop money or are most of your guys doing small accounts? Cause I know you've got this small account challenge you're doing. Some guys will leave the service because again, we try to teach them how to fish. So they'll go out on their own and they'll go find a challenge and get prop money and start trading prop money. Um, there's only a handful of guys like that <clears throat> so far. Um, the danger I think in prop trading challenges for traders who are new or not experienced is if they step into something at the right place at the right time and think they have the answer and then they get funded and then all of a sudden things start going the opposite way. I think that's a real risk that's unseen and unknown and un, you know, that like they're just not going to know until they, they step into it. So that, that's a, that's a, that's a danger for younger people who are looking to do that, right? Does that, does that con outweigh 
the pros of having other people's money in your mind? I'm just, I want your perspective, you know, because we were emailing going back and forth. I don't think so. I, I only, I only, I guess I only started paying attention to it after you came on and talked to us and, and, and raised it and mentioned it. And I was like, okay, I'll, I'll take a look and, and see what these guys are up to. Because to me, it just looked like, okay, these guys are out here and they're saying, if you want to get X number of dollars of our, of our capital, you've got to pay, you know, three grand or whatever it is. You come in and here are our rules and um, you, you, you trade these particular equities or whatever it is in this particular time frame, and you have to have this type of return in order for us to say, we'll, we'll fund you with our capital. To me, what it looked like was a trap for somebody looking to get their hands on what they would perceive as easy capital and for the people dangling the carrot to just sit there and, and collect three grand every day from hundreds of people. I was like, well, that's not a bad model. Maybe I should do that. <laughs> right? I, I had, I've had companies email me and say, do you want to white label what we're doing and create your own company? And I was like, no, no, no. Cause I don't want those headaches. But the, the thing that kept me out of it. So I work with a guy in South Africa. He's been funded uh, with a couple of firms for over two years. I saw the payouts he was getting 25 grand, $50,000 one month. I was like, at that, after a year, basically of him getting those payouts, I was like, I, I got to check this out more. I have to see more. But what kept me out, and for him, it just never was a problem. I felt like these firms didn't need to put our orders through the market. And you were going to get paid on playing this game of trading, but you were getting paid out on signup fees from other people that failed. Right. That, yep. that to me, it just rubbed me the wrong way. I'm like, that's not trading, you know? Agreed. Yeah. Yeah. So, so that, was, that was what, and, that, and again, that's part of that world that I don't know is, is if you sign up, you, yeah. you pay somebody that money, yeah. where are those trades being executed? Are you, are you, exactly. Are, is, it's is, very is it hard. Time? Is it delayed? Like exactly. there, there's a lot of, it just looks super shady and, and super shady. Hey, here's just an, yet another spur of what goes on in this industry. That's super, super slimy where somebody is just going to go out and collect other people's money, right? Well, I think like when you put it like that and we talk with somebody like like yourself who's been around for a longer time, like there's always been slimy stuff, just like in any industry. Yep. I tell the story, like my mom hired a, a guy to do work in our backyard once. She paid him 30 grand, which was like, I think half of it. He never showed up. He just took the 30 grand and ran. My dad had to assume it was a whole thing. So it's like, yeah. th there's scams in every industry. You got to do your yep. own research. You got to check their reviews. Yep. You got to check it out. So like you have, I mean- the scams on the one spectrum of like the people who take my pictures and sell DM people and say, give me your Bitcoin. They're like, the, and people do it. It's crazy. Those people, and I mean, we don't need to talk about that, but there's those scams. And then there's these ones like with these firms where it's like just a gray area, like you said, where like some of the firms are not transparent with how are they making those orders happen in the live market. Right. Like you should right. show us that. And I think yep. another part of it that rubs me or has rubbed me the wrong way, for example, some of the firms, you have two phases. The first phase is a shorter amount of time, but a larger percentage gain. The second phase is a longer amount of time with a smaller percentage gain. I just feel like it should be inversed. If you really cared about finding good traders, all your rules should align with good traders. But when you have these right. little things in there that are meant to make someone fail, that's where I start to say, are you really aligned with me trading well, or do you just want my, my signup fee, which is fine. And I'm getting yeah. payouts every two weeks now. So there are guys like myself who like James and some of the guys we work with that are seeing the results of, but like I've been trading eight years. I've lost tons of money when in my first two years, over 40 grand. I've made so many mistakes that now I'm pretty good at money management. I can manage the 300 K that they've given me and I'm putting it in profit <clears throat> every two weeks to take that payout. So I feel like there's a small group, like you said. But just like in anything, are, isn't there always a small group of people that are making the most money? Well, even if there's a bunch of doctors, there's probably a small group of doctors that make a ton of money, you know, like a ridiculous amount of money. So I think, it, right, in any industry, it's like that. Yeah, I think 80-20 rules apply in, right. in more situations than not. Right, right. Yeah, and I think that when you... What did, what I, this is my last point that I was going to bring up about the prop thing. And we had gone back and forth about emails about it. It's going to open the door. For regulation, I think there will be regulation eventually. I think it'll open the door, though, for some of these firms, like there's one in Florida that I've been talking to, they can come in and be extremely transparent, show us how those live orders are happening, show us where the money is coming from, the venture capital or wherever the money, like explain that 
Now we're starting to understand that we're on the same page. You actually want real traders there. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. Um, and I think that that's that part of the, part of my hesitation is the time, effort, and energy that needs to be spent to read all the rules, to research who it is that's putting the prop together. Where is that prop money coming from? Like you mentioned, hey, is, is there transparency in the, the trades? Like, I don't know that I want to spend it. Like if, if, if there's somebody like you that does the legwork and says, these are, these are good out of, you know, 20, then I can say, and, and you're like, here's two, then, then I'm more comfortable doing the research on two and throwing the other ones to the oh, side. Yeah, but there's so many right? now, like, like, like yeah. I said, they are emailing me, they're emailing anybody with a following saying, Hey, you want to start one, get your, get your own thing. And like, I, I felt like, and this is where maybe you and me have come into education from a different way, but like, I, since I started creating content on the internet and started building a following, I've had brokers like Oanda, not them specifically, but whoever else, these brokerages, just like there's a million prop firms, reach out to me and say, hey, if you use this link and send your people here, you're going to get paid on every trade, win or lose. And I've never affiliated myself in any way with one of those because to me, back to morals, conflict of interest. I'm here to teach you how to trade. If I get paid, whether you win or lose, anyone with a brain is going to be like, hey, bro, that, there's something wrong here, right? So I think yes. like, yeah, good. No, I was just gonna, I, I, I agree with you. I think that there are, there are a lot. I still think that human nature and people who are looking for a way are still going to gravitate towards, wow, somebody's offering me capital. And I see this as an easy path and it's just not the case. And not. I think that they'll lure more people to cough up their, their challenge fee. And those people may show up one time, two times, three times. And, you know, next thing you know, somebody is out 10 grand because they, they can't get through a challenge and they, they keep trying and it makes no sense. And you're, you're so right. It makes no sense to me because like, I've seen some of these guys spend thousands of dollars yeah. on a challenge that if they passed it, they might, it might be like a 10,000, 25,000, or even just a $50,000 account. You're going to spend right. all this money just to trade 50K. You're not even going to make a lot of money with 50K. So it's right. like, people. I think you're so spot on. It's going, they're fishing off the bottom. They're making a ton of money off the bottom feeders. Yep. And and it's kind of, it, it makes me upset a little, not a lot, but like a little bit because I know those people. Like I'm fortunate that I've come from a background where I wasn't living on the street. But I know some of these people that are buying these challenges in other, in other countries, they're very poor. They just can't yeah. afford to think bigger, you know? And I think that that then keeps them in that wheel, taking the challenge, yeah. taking the small challenge. Maybe they get funded, but the payouts aren't enough now. And we didn't really talk about this, but undercapitalization, I think is a big problem for traders. We spoke about this a little bit on the misfit thing, but like you're trading an amount of money and you're, tra even if you know how to trade, you end up breaking rules because the money isn't satisfied. You know, it's not yeah. enough. And I think that then when you flip that and you give a trader a lot of money, they start to trade way different, right? Would you agree with that too? Like once you're trading more money, you're like more conservative. You're looking to pick your spots more. You don't want to loop, you know, because your percentage gain is smaller, but your dollar gain is much bigger. Yeah, I, I for the most part, I agree with that. And it's one of the reasons that I like um, using options as the vehicle because the leverage for the capital outlay, so the risk versus reward um, is much less for the option trader versus the equity holder. Yeah. And when you're an equity holder, by nature of holding the equity, you are a long only investor. And we all, we've just talked about it. We all know that that's, that that's just not, unless you have time, time nullifies pretty much everything. If it's, if it's you know fundamentally sound and you're buying in a place where um, you know, just like a house, you're you're not buying the most expensive house on on the block, and you're buying at a time where you know the economy is not not so great. You know that in 20 years, you're likely to have a nice appreciating asset. But if you don't have that as an investor, it's very very difficult to to move the needle. A, a thing like trading options is different because it will give you um, the same type of return potential with out the capital outlay and there's a conservative aspect to it because of the 
details that, that are involved in the options. For example, implied volatility, time, theta, right? Delta, like how much is the option going to move versus the underlying? And if you're in all of those things and you use the levers properly, it's a very different environment. So somebody who has a smaller pile of capital has an opportunity, but generally somebody with a smaller pile of, of capital trying to do things like what you're doing is, is a very, very difficult proposition. And, and even with the options, it's a very difficult proposition because there is so much to know and balance properly to make it work. That's hundred percent. That, that's the challenge. A hundred percent. And I think from my perspective as someone that I've never traded options and it just what never in my path to this point, I haven't gotten into it. Mm -hmm. I think most people will agree with me. The guys that trade options are always the guys that I've seen making the most money, the equity holder, the equity traders, they do well, but I've, I've always seen the options guys crushing it. And it's probably because of that. There's a conservative approach to using its volatility to your advantage and you can catch unbelievable. I've seen some of Lucci's trades, unbelievable rips, you know? Yep. And that, so that's, that's another point to what you're talking about. Lucci is somebody who's well capitalized, yes. right? Yes. And he understands and he knows, and he's very, very transparent about, Hey, this is what I'm doing. And this is the size of the trade that's out there. And if it doesn't work for me, this is the type of loss that I'll incur. If it works for me, this is the type of gain that I'll, that I'll reap. Right. So he's very transparent about that. And I think, again, what it, what attracts people to that is what they see is they only see the reward. They don't see the, um, the consternation. They don't see the effort. They don't see the, um, the decision-making that he has to make when he's in a position that has him in a very uncomfortable situation. I've seen him down $150,000, $300,000 in the morning and then up five hundred dollars in the afternoon. For most people, that's not sustainable, right? It, emotionally, it's not sustainable. Psychologically, it's not it, it, it's not sustainable. Um, so there there are different ways to view it, and using a lot. Of, in, in, uh, the the more understanding you have of the vehicle that you use and when to when it's appropriate for you to use it is just as important as looking at. You know, somebody like Lucci, can you as a trader get to that type of level that, that where Lucci is at? Yes, you can. Do you want to ride that lightning every day? That's a different story. And if, if you are somebody who is like that, that that's fine. There's, there's a place for you, right? If you're not somebody who's who's like that and, you know, you, 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 the things that you have and that you've built, um, you, you don't take for granted and, and you want to protect that and you don't want to put yourself in a situation where you wake up in the morning and, and it's all going to be gone, then you have to take a different approach. It's, it's one thing to come in and say, I've got 10 grand and I want to turn it into a million dollars. It can be done, but how are you going to go about it? And if it's just on black, that's, you know, put, put the money on black, put the money on red that's a way to do it. You can, and it, the, the only issue is if you do succeed, succeed that way, the likelihood of you continuing that type of decision-making process continues. And, and somewhere in there, you're, you will get caught and it will be very painful. Right. Definitely. So Definitely. I think, again, it's, it's, we're, you know, you try to teach people how if this is a, here's a Swiss army knife. Here's how to use it. Here's, here's when to use it and the situations you should use it. That That's what I like about um, the options side of what we do. And, and you, you can look at it through the lens of short-term, medium-term, long-term, and versus the equity holder, the amount of capital risk that gets taken in options is far less with greater leverage without having to use margin. I don't think, in my opinion, there's no better way to accomplish that task than using that vehicle as your investment mode. That's, yeah. that's, that's just how I've been trained and that's how I use those, those vehicles. And, you know, again, people who don't, under, don't understand it think it's, it's just a, you know, it's, it's a, it's a hit the home run or nothing. It, it's nothing like that. There, no. There's a very, 
you know, methodical, conservative way to go about it. And then there will be times where things will, you know, the bamboo will will grow mm -hmm. by feet in a month, right? But, but, but it takes a long, long time to recognize and find those little spots and you don't get them all of the time. And when you get them, you have to recognize that it, it's fleeting, right? Mm -hmm. And that you need to care for it. And put it away and then move on to the next one. It's a great way to put it, that it is fleeting. I love that. Yep. Um, as we're coming on the hour, because I don't want to keep you more than the hour. This has been great. I want to hit you with a couple of quick questions. Are you a 401k guy? Um, do, do I, like, what do you mean by that? As an options trader, I'm a younger guy than you. Are you, you're you're speculating with your options, no matter yeah. what. That is still not investing, like you said, the the guy buying ETFs and just holding it. Have you been like throughout? Your, I'm just curious. Like, give me some. I'm younger than you. If you can't tell, yeah, give me some, I mean, I, give me some I, advice. I, do I do we do the 401k I, or do we just speculate straight? My thought. It, well, if you're self employed, you probably have like a like a. Uh, I have a set. CEO. Yeah, I have a set. Okay. So I, I think that that's a great vehicle to put money away. Again, what we talked about was if you have a long time horizon. To me, the simplest thing to do is is if you if you have gains and you have windfall and you have time, why wouldn't you just take that money and sock it into an S and P five hundred fund and just let that take care of itself over time while you continue continue your other activity? Fill the buckets. Over, there are different buckets. Exactly, yeah, exactly. Right. Like I, I I would never say to somebody all options all options all, all options, the time right. all speculation do, right. Right. There are things like, you know, there are other things like, um, like real estate investments. I was just going to say, right. You know, you know it may, maybe what you do is you take, you know, your, your profits and, and your, your passion or what you're good at is, um, okay. I, like I, I, I want to buy land and, and, and build houses, or I want to buy apartment complexes and, and, you know, provide places to live and, um, generate income that way. It, it might be, I'm going to take this money. I'm going to, I know I have a long-term time horizon and I want to put it in S and P 500 fund, or I want to buy X, Y, Z stock. And I think that over the next 20 years, it's, it's going to be great. Or, you know, there, there's, there's so many different avenues and it's the, the market is just one place to, to look at it. So, you know, 401k long-term time horizon, I don't see why you wouldn't. It's never proven wrong, right? Like it's, it has no. not proven wrong yet, unless America is going to shit, in which case your 401k will be the last thing you worry about. You probably want 401 bullets and that's about all you'll need. You know, do you, do you feel like, well, before we go on to the next quick question, pick a stock for us. If, if I, if you only could trade and hold one stock, you could add into it. You got to hold it for longer than let's say the next 15, 20 years. What would your company be if you had to pick one? Um, for that, for that long of a time horizon. 20 years. That's that's a tough one because I have to straddle the line between do I do I try to pick something that's growth or do I try to pick something that already has some stability to it but will also have good long term appreciation. So Everybody remember is, this. I got Ron on the ropes right here. This is a I got him stumped <laughs> on this question. Come on, it's, it's basically you go on Apple or Tesla, right? Yeah, well, definitely not Tesla. No, definitely <laughs> not. Tesla. I'm I'm not a Tesla guy either. Like Tesla. that. Um, I, you know, I, I look at something like Microsoft or, or Amazon, um, even something like Walmart or a Costco from, and th those are, those in my opinion are more of a conservative type of view. Sure. And then I look at something like, let's say a crowd strike and, um, say, gosh, from a, from a growth perspective, something like that. Yep. And that's, that's where a lot of people, if they can find something that has that amazing growth trajectory through a period of let's say three to five years, that's where a lot of wealth can be. Well, generated. absolutely. I mean, look at look at Tesla, right? It was sideways for six or seven years, and then in three years, like you just said, it went from it, it's six x, right, seven x, something like that. It is. It is a great trading vehicle. I don't know that it is a great investment. I'm not saying right. that it's. Not. I'm saying I don't know if I don't it know is. either. Well, because it has uncertainty. I don't know. Right. Exactly. It, it's it's CEO is a, a bit of an uncertain guy and yep. all the legs of that business could be substitute or broken off into subsidiaries and have other businesses. So that's very, yep. that's a very detailed business. So that'll stem us perfectly into, to this last point well, right now. Let me just add, yeah, let please, me add one please. more thing if I can. Please. I think what, what also is difficult with what you just asked is you're mixing fundamental analysis with 
technicals and what looks like fundamentally could be good years from now may have crazy fits and starts in between, which may or may not allow you to stay in. And I think people really struggle with how do I, first of all, understand the fundamental analysis and that picture versus what's actually happening with it in and out today and how do those headlines mess with my view of it over time. I think that most people struggle to put those things together. I totally agree. And I would even agree more with what you said about, are you going to hold in? Everybody loves to talk. Amazon, if you would have put money in in 2000, what it would be yeah. today, are you dealing through 92% drawdown? Yeah. I, I, most people won't. Most people will not. 100%. Yeah. Right. Exactly. Yeah. So great, great point. Um, to our last point. S&P yep. today, we had our FOMC before we started. Looks like you were right. It's down now, new low a day, 39.84 right now. Yep. yep. I'm trying to find bullish information that would counter my bearish bias. I made money short spy earlier this week. I'm very heavily short biased right now, like a lot of people are. You have the inverted yield curve that has been right on pr predicting recessions nine out of the last nine. You have yep. unemployment seeming to be on the rise, especially in tech. We had on, on the technicals, so those are some fundamentals. On the technicals, the S&P um, 8 and 21 EMAs are what I use. They just crossed down yesterday for the first time in a couple of months. I think we're, in my eyes, just a couple of big red days away from everybody thinking 100% still bear market. What is your thoughts? Because I know you do look at SPY a lot, so I'm interested to just kind of get a take from you on where do we go from here? 4,500, 3,500? What determines it? Oh, so I, I just generally, I've one of the things, and again, I, I told you about um, the, my original mentor and his ability to help me understand and, and read things from a technical perspective. And most of that is based on, well, what time frame are you looking at? And how do you, do, do you use the things that are available to you properly? So for example, um, do you understand you know, what the moving averages are. You just mentioned the eight and the 21. I use the eight and the 21 often. When the eight and the 21 cross over, they oftentimes signal a change in direction. It doesn't mean that it's going to happen, but it, it is it, it is a very good indicator of directional change. So if you look at the S&P 500 over the last, what, 15 months, there every single time that it has tried to break out of its pattern it has been unable to do that so if you apply some simple things to give you an idea of where you think things might wind up fibonacci retracement is a very simple type of a tool to use to apply so for example if you put fibonacci on the bottom of the pandemic low to the most recent high the 50 percent retracement wound up pretty much right at 350, which it, and it hit that area almost to the penny and bounced. When it bounced back up, it challenged the 200-day moving average. And, and currently, you know, if you, you go back to somebody like Brian Shannon and when he uses anchored VWAP, right? Look at where the anchored VWAP from last year is compared to where this year is. And you have some really clear target areas to 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 choose from. So it's not predictive that that's where we're going. It's to say, hey, these are the areas where we want to pay attention for, for change. It doesn't mean that you do business at those spots, but very simply, the S&P 500, the 50-day moving average, it's kind of where we're at right now. The 200 is next. You know, the, the bigger picture FIB off of that pandemic is at 380. You know, below that, you got 350 again. Those are all areas where you, you could continue to see the S&P 500 get pushed too. I don't see anything catalyst wise that changes the picture That's just yet. Right. Right. I don't think anything changes that picture just yet. I think it stays where it's at for now until some of those other, what you're just talking about, those fundamental or economic, you know, things come around to change. And I don't have the, I'm, that's not how I'm trained. There are people who are so much smarter than I am that get paid big dollars to be able to come up with that information and ultimately those people are right maybe 60 40 I, I like i had a tweet that everybody liked a couple of weeks ago i was like analysts get paid to talk traders get paid to follow a pro like a winning process it was something like that where i was just saying like because 
you, any of these analysts can just throw out numbers. They could wake up today and be in a bad mood. They fought with their wife last night. Now they're up. Oh, Tesla's actually going down and they'll just, and that'll change the sentiment. Cause there's a lot of amateurs. I think that do kind of follow some of those analysts, you know, because they put it on CNBC, they pump it out to everybody. I think that, um, my knowledge has grown a lot in the last two years with regards to inflation in the fed. I've been really following it. And like, I finally start to understand like the difference between what hawkishness means for the market, what bear, what, um, dovishness could mean for the market like just getting more deep of an understanding and seeing how does the fundamental paint the technical you know what i'm saying and then how can we how can we generate trade ideas from that you know i have an indicator on my chart i use a tdi so it's like a sentiment indicator sentiment mm -hmm. today and yesterday extremely bearish on i'm looking at a 15 minute time frame for my day trades extremely yeah. bearish so yesterday easy money making shorts today same thing generating short ideas even on the news today you would have in my eyes well in my indicator we would only be looking for shorts the buys are just not my business you know kind of i like how you said it we're looking for these areas to do business you know so barring this the fed deciding to pivot and just start cutting rates which i don't see happening at all i mean the market reacting today to the speech says that that's not happening we could see rate hikes all year and i'm worried where people might think we're gonna have that big red candles, boom, boom, boom. I'm worried it might be one of them slow crawl recessions. Do you think it could be that? Well, when it comes to those types of things, I think, um, I, I, again, I, I'm, I'm not an economist, so I, I can't really speak to for sure what, you know, what I think, you know, what I think is going to happen. And I think recessions are, um, are local to, I mean, the, the, the economic picture is one thing. Recessions are also local, right? Are, are you yourself in a recessionary period, right? Or do you, do you need to earn more money so that you can pay for the things that you need to have at home? Mm -hmm. If that's the case, you're in a recessionary period. If you're keeping pace with what's happening, you have a good job and your job is paying you more, or you've saved or your um, your investments have, have done well and you have some cushion and padding, you're not necessarily in a recessionary environment. I, I kind of like to look at it through that lens a little bit. And the market being a forward-looking indicator kind of tells you when we're in and when we're out of a recession. I think traders, people believed with the most recent run-up that the worst was behind us. And my mindset was, well, it it, it needs to be, um, again, to quote Brian Shannon, it, the market is guilty until it's proven innocent. It has done the same thing and it can't break out of this pattern. There's no reason for me to believe that it can break this pattern until the bigger picture changes. So when you say something like, hey, is it recessionary? It's probably recessionary. Rates are continuing to go up and that doesn't necessarily help a lot of people. It, it, it gives guys like you and me an advantage because if, let's just say when we get to a certain area, we're looking for a move back down to an area where it came from, right? right? So understanding that dynamic takes the pressure off of things like, well, how long do you think the economy is going to stay like this? It's like, well, I don't know. I don't have an answer. I don't necessarily care. And when it finally changes and the skies get bluer, we'll know, right? Like things will change. There'll be different, what you just talked about, there'll be different language from the Fed. There'll be different changes in, um, in interest rate posture. There'll be different posture towards um, trade and goods and services and what they cost and are there going to be you know increasing airfares those types of things like I can't predict any of it I don't know where those things are going but I can see from the market where they're at and how I can trade so I, I try not to fill my head with some of those other deeper level thoughts because it, it, it what it winds up doing is creating anxiety unnecessarily and putting me in a in a, a a mindset that that doesn't allow me to trade what in the areas and the things that I look for it won't allow me to make those types of trades and I, that's where mistakes happen and mistakes do happen and I will make mistakes and I will lose from from time to time that's just a normal you know way of of, of trading I'm the same I I totally can relate to what you're saying I I remember as you're talking about it days I'm writing in my journal saying 
I was all the, the news and all the information on Twitter and everything I'm taking in today is not, it's distracted me from that easy technical move or whatever, you know, and it pulls you away from it. So I think like you and I are probably very similar. We want to have enough information, but not too much because it creates paralysis by analysis. And now I'm missing my edge and I'm missing the trade that I know I should be in 10 times out of 10, you know? Yeah. yeah. Yep. Great. I love it. Listen, Ron, this has been amazing. I really yep. appreciate Thanks, you giving Austin. us the hour. It. No, it was really great speaking with you. Really quick, tell everybody where they can connect with you, where they can find the the room and everything like that. Um, yeah, I mean, if you go to wallstreetjesus.com and then um, if you're looking for Lucci, you know, you'll you'll find Lucci at wallstreetjesus.com and you'll also find me that the service that I run is Trading the Post and you can find us at tradingthepost.com and also we're we're on Twitter at uh, at Trading the Post. So you can find us in those those spots and you know, we, we post those, um, those videos daily and you, you're getting my insights and what I'm looking at. That's not something we charge for when we, obviously we post it on Twitter and we're just trying to share, you know, what we know, but it's a good fit for you. Then come over and check us out. And that's it. We, we, we offer free 14 day trials. So there's, there's really not a, there's not a, a big risk for anybody to, to take. And we're not out here saying, Hey, we, we want your money. We're saying, is, is does this look like a fit for you? That's it. And I tell everybody, when you want to learn options, I send them to you guys every time. And I'm not just saying that because you're on the show. I, I just know from the testimonials I see, when I'm ready to learn options, I'm coming to you guys like you guys are cream of the crop. And for everybody listening, we actually are having Lucci on the podcast for the next episode. So that'll be a nice awesome. follow-up. I had to have you on first, Ron. Just don't want to inflate Lucci's ego too much. You know what I'm saying? Like you got to keep it in check, keep them chilled out. So no, this has been great. Enjoy your uh, your Hawaii time. I really appreciate it again. And for everybody listening, hit us in the comments on YouTube. Let us know if you have any questions for Ron. I'm sure I'll be able to steal them for another hour, maybe later this year, and we can dive deeper into some of his trading strategies, his favorite trade. I had a ton of other questions, but Ron and I could sit here and talk for a while. We didn't talk about the Eagles, Ron. The the Eagles beating your San Francisco. <laughs> and then well, you guys, you know what? To your to your credit. Um, you knocked the quarterback out of the game and it made it a non-game. Literally. It, as, a, as a San Francisco fan, I was bummed because I didn't get to see the game that I wanted to see. From your perspective, your team did what they were supposed to do. They knocked Yeah, but it was painful. The like the guy out. It I, I it was painful to watch that. And then Josh Gordon, I think, is that the 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 guy who was the fourth string or whatever? He gets a concussion. Painful. Oh, it was painful yeah. to watch that happen. And then yeah. In the Super Bowl, to have the Chiefs end the game the way they did on us, it, it was almost like retribution. Like we won a game that was kind of terrible in the Dramatic. end, and then we lost a game that was terrible in the end. You know what I mean? It, I will say though that the the the, the game was entertaining, and yes. I always in the back of my mind with Patrick Mahomes. It doesn't matter who he plays and how good the other team is. You're like he's not dead until the clock is at zero. It's he's just that good. He is that good. He is the new Tom Brady. He, re I really yeah. believe it. Yeah. Yeah. All right, Ron, you're free. Thank you again, man. It's been great. Right, I, will, uh, I will keep you posted when this is ready to go live. We'll get that all squared away and everything. And then uh, we'll chat again soon. Thanks, my friend. Thanks, Ron. Thanks, everybody. Bye. We'll see you guys yeah. in the next episode. Bye.